I've been, re- hey everybody, Matt Coville. I've been rereading The Lord of the Rings, which is actually pretty unusual for me, even though I'm a huge fan of these books and this world and Tolkien as a writer. And I'm in the part where you meet Tom Bombadil. And for a lot of reasons that we're going to go over in this video, I feel a lot more now like I understand why that dude put this stuff in this book. And that's what this video is going to be about. This all started just a couple of years ago, pretty recently, actually, when I discovered the BBC 1981 radio production of The Lord of the Rings, which I think is fantastic. It's a radio play. It's different actors doing the different parts. It's an adaptation. It's not someone, it's not an audio book. It's not someone just reading the thing out. It's, you know, theater of the mind and they have special effects and music and it's an adaptation. It's like 14 or 16 hours long. And if you are someone who is at all a fan of The Lord of the Rings, if you like the movies, but you bounced off the book or you love the book and you feel like the movies didn't really do it justice, I think that this is something you should check out. It's got Ian Holm, longtime friend to genre movies, who the guy who played Bilbo in the Lord of the Rings trilogy playing Frodo in this series. It's also got Bill Nighy, who is probably my favorite actor playing Sam Gamgee, which is great because Bill Nighy is doing Sam Gamgee's real accent, the accent that Sam Gamgee is supposed to have in the book. And in fact, a lot of the characters in this radio play, because it was produced by the BBC, they took this stuff seriously. And all the characters that you meet from like the Shire through Tilbury, like Barlam and Butterbur, sounds the way Barlin Butterbur is supposed to sound based on where a character that would live in England. It's a tremendous amount of fun. I think it's a brilliant adaptation. It's not a word for word reading of it. They, they have to invent a lot of things and concatenate stuff just like you do anytime you're adapting something. But if there was stuff in the Peter Jackson trilogy that you missed from the books, there's a good chance that it's in here. Something that's missing though is, and this I think cut from virtually every single adaptation of Lord of the Rings, is Tom Bombadil. And that's kind of where this video started was I was rereading the Lord of the Rings and I was making a special point not to skip all the stuff I normally skip. I bounced off the trilogy when I was a teenager. I much preferred The Hobbit. But then when I was in college, I read the entire thing and I liked some of it more than others. And I would occasionally go back to it and reread it. But I would skip kind of the boring stuff as opposed to Dune, for instance, which I think I read every year for about 15 years. But a lot of the stuff from the Shire through to the point where we meet Strider, I found really overwritten and skippable. But I've sort of come around on that. My fandom with The Lord of the Rings started when I was in my late 20s because I was working on a Lord of the Rings role-playing game, tabletop role-playing game, but I was also a semi-competitive player in the Middle Earth collectible card game, which was a fantastic game, very complex game. And the art in it is astonishing. It does a really good job of simulating the things that happen in the books and gamifying them. Some of the art in this was so good that it inspired specific moments and scenes in the Peter Jackson trilogy. Because of that, because of my newfound fascination in my late 20s with the Lord of the Rings. I read both of Tom Shippey's books on the Lord of the Rings. He's written a couple of things. You can watch his uh, video lectures from him that he's done. The guy knows a lot about Tolkien. He holds the same professorial chair at Oxford that Tolkien did. But around that same time, I discovered this series by Christopher Tolkien that's called The History of Middle-Earth. And it's like, I don't know, man, it might be 16 or 20 volumes. And it's Tolkien, Christopher Tolkien, J.R.R. Tolkien's son and the executor of his estate, going through all of his notes and collecting it. And that's where we get, really, that's where we get like the Silmarillion from. That was kind of the first thing he did was he took Tolkien's almost finished version of the Silmarillion and edited it and finished it. And then because he had this huge backlog of notes, all these different drafts of these books and a ton of stuff that never made it into any of the books, he started collecting it all and releasing them in different volumes. And around the time when I was becoming really fascinated by the book and the world and the author, we get this, which is in the middle of the history of Middle Earth, which, like I said, is like 16 or 20 volumes. There's a four volume series called The History of the Lord of the Rings, which is almost literally the DVD commentary of the writing of the Lord of the Rings. It includes all of the different drafts that Tolkien wrote. And the crazy thing about the guy is because there were no computers, there were no, he didn't use a typewriter, he did everything by longhand. He would think by writing. When he had a problem, he would write it down and he would basically have a dialogue with himself about how to solve that problem. I am fascinated by the creative process as an author, as a writer. I am fascinated by people that do it. And this is the best example I've ever seen of how a major work came into being. And it's crazy. Like no one has ever written a book like this before and nobody ever will again. 
he would basically just, with no outline, sitting down just to write a sequel to The Hobbit, no idea that this book took place in Middle Earth, because The Hobbit originally did not when it was first released. It just borrowed some names from Middle Earth. It wasn't meant to be part of his legendarium. So as he's writing, he just sits down and figures, I'm just going to write about hobbits until something interesting happens. And when he writes himself into a corner, and he did this several times, when he writes himself into a corner, he stops, sometimes for months. I think in one case he had to stop for a couple of years because World War II happened and he was a teacher. And when he finally has a solution, he doesn't pick up where he left off. He starts writing the entire book all over again from scratch, which is crazy. Mostly what he was doing was copying his previous version, literally just copying it word for word. And that's where he would change stuff. Whenever he came across something that either in some cases just bored him because he had written it several times or as his idea of the book changed, he's like, no, this doesn't make sense anymore. He would change the names of things. So for instance, uh, Strider is originally not a guy named Aragorn. He was a hobbit named Trotter that was called Trotter because he wore wooden shoes. And at one point he was secretly Bilbo in disguise. One of the problems Tolkien struggled with was how to write a sequel to The Hobbit, because presumably the sequel to The Hobbit would have to star The Hobbit, but yet he wrote at the end of The Hobbit that Bilbo lived happily ever after. So that he spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to solve that problem, including stuff like he had the idea that maybe Bilbo was going to go off and get married, and that was this adventure. And at one point, he decided that Bilbo was struck by, he had run out of money, and he was struck by dragon greed. And so he's going to go to Rivendell, and he's going to ask Elrond for help with this. So you get this really short note that's kind of jotted down in the marginalia of another draft where he writes down what he thinks the book might be about. He's going to go ask Elrond what he can do to heal his money wish and unsettlement. Elrond tells him of an island, Britain, far west where the elves still reign. Journey to a perilous isle. I want to look again on a live dragon. That's the entire note, by the way. So for at least a little while, Tolkien thought the sequel to The Hobbit was gonna be about Bilbo going to England to meet elves and maybe fight another dragon. So there are four volumes in this. There's The Return of the Shadow, there's The Treason of Isengard, there's The War of the Ring, and Sauron Defeated. And these are all names, by the way, that he'd originally intended to title the books when The Lord of the Rings was gonna be six books, it needed six titles, but then they decided to release it as three books and we lost a couple of those titles and he resurrected them. Christopher Tolkien did the series. These four books are filled with astonishing moments like that where you see things that things that were obvious to you because you've read the books Tolkien wouldn't figure out for quite a long time and just the way he would get stuck on problems and then work them and you get to see his thought process which you don't normally get to do with a writer. For instance like the entire subplot with Saruman comes up and exists because Tolkien wanted the hobbits to have an encounter with the ringwraiths. They started off just as black writers then he decided they were ringwraiths but he didn't know what a ring Wraith was yet exactly. He didn't know they were the Nazgul yet. In fact, at one point he refers to them as elf wraiths because they could be the uh, the wraiths of the elves that had been given rings. But he figures, since he doesn't know they're Nazgul, he figures if Gandalf is there when these Black Riders show up to pester the hobbits, then Gandalf will make short work of the Black Riders, so Gandalf can't be there. Where is Gandalf? He must be somewhere. He must be restrained somewhere because if he could, he would come help the hobbits. So he must be prisoner. Who is strong enough and interesting enough to hold Gandalf prisoner? And he made a list of possible answers, including Fanghorn, which at one point was maybe a, a person, uh, Treebeard, which maybe at one point was a giant, and then he writes Saruman, and that's where the entire subplot of Saruman comes from. At this point, armed with all this knowledge, I trick myself into thinking that I understand Tolkien as a writer, that I understand his thought process and what was important to him. So when I get to something like Tom Bombadil, where I used to think this was just incredibly indulgent, I no longer think that way and I sort of feel like I understand how Tom Bombadil fits into the larger structure of the first part of The Lord of the Rings. We see people online who really want to believe that there is an answer to the question of who is Tom Bombadil. And that to me is entirely contrary to the spirit of the books. There is no answer other than Tom Bombadil was the name of a doll that his kids had gotten, I think from Holland, and Tolkien just wanted to throw into the books because he thought it would be neat and he liked the idea that there were mysteries that had no answer. But I think while that is true and any other answer is misleading, I think that there is a reason he chose uh, Tom Bombadil. He needed something, and Tom Bombadil is just something he had nearby. He had a hole he wanted to fill in that first part of the book, and Tom Bombadil filled it neatly. 
this is going to be incredibly obvious to some people watching this, but for me now armed with this knowledge, reading the fellowship of the ring, not skipping the parts I used to skip. I feel like I understand better why we have the Shire and the old forest and how, what we're really doing is we're journeying through three different and distinct worlds, the Shire, the old forest, and the real world, Tolkien, the real world of Tolkien's legendarium. One of the major criticisms of the Lord of the Rings, it was one of my criticisms up until now, was that all that stuff in the beginning of the Fellowship of the Ring, all that stuff in the Shire, it lacked drama. It was indulgent and overwritten. And it does lack drama. And I, I think it is indulgent in places. And I think it is overwritten in places. But it's there for a reason. And it serves a purpose. The reason it lacks drama is because it is meant to represent an Edenic existence. It is like Eden. In Eden, there is no crime. There is no birth or death. There is no good or evil. There is not even knowledge of male and female. Adam and Eve are there, but they don't know what is it that makes them different. In the Shire, there is no crime. There is no sense of the passage of time. There's no birth or death. There are young hobbits and middle-aged hobbits and old hobbits, but we never see a hobbit die for any reason. And we never hear about a pregnant hobbit for any reason. There are no pregnant hobbits because there's no sex. There are no women apart from a character that we only hear one or two lines of dialogue from and is just there to show that there's like, you know, hobbits are gossipy. There's no women. It's an entirely male world. Once we leave Shire and the Old Forest and enter the real world, then we start to meet female characters, and including some really cool female characters. In the real world that starts at Bree and goes for the rest of the book, there is death and life. There is love and gender and all that stuff. But here in the Shire, there's none of that. The Shire is this utopian, perfect existence. That's the reason the shadow of the past is interesting to us as readers compared to the rest of that part of the book, because it's the real world, Tolkien's real world of Middle-earth intruding. Gandalf represents the real world coming to Frodo, delivering this crazy knowledge, and that knowledge changes Frodo, and now he can't stay in Eden anymore. This is Tolkien's version of the Tree of Knowledge. Now that Gandalf has imparted this terrible wisdom unto Frodo, he's got to leave, and where does he go? He goes through the Old Forest. The Old Forest is a borderland between Eden and the real world. And like a fairy tale world, there are dangers here, but these dangers are easily and trivially solved by knowledge. And that's what Tom Bombadil represents. Tom Bombadil is there to show that Old Man Willow, the Barrow White, are easily dealt with if only you have the knowledge of the natural world, if only you know this terrain and this world. And that's important. It's important to Tolkien. Tom Bombadil is master. Tom Bombadil knows everything about this place, but Tellingly, he never tries to exploit nature in any way. It never occurs to him to try to dig all the coal out of the ground and use it for anything. For Tom, knowledge is good for itself. So there are fairy tale dangers that are solved with fairy tale solutions. Tom Bombadil shows up and sings at the Barrow White and Old Man Willow and solves all the problems. Speaking of Tom Bombadil and nature, that brings us to a section. I'm just going to read a brief section here that kind of is an example of both the role of nature in this fairy tale world of the old forest and some of what I think is Tolkien's kind of overwriting. This is two paragraphs from chapter seven in the house of Tom Bombadil. The four hobbits stepped. We know how many hobbits are don't we? Couldn't you have just said the hobbits? The four hobbits stepped over the wide stone threshold and stood still, blinking. So far, so good. They were in a long, low room filled with the light of lamps swinging from the beams of the roof, and on the table of dark, polished wood stood many candles, tall and yellow, burning brightly. John, what are you doing? We know what candles are. In a chair at the far side of the room, facing the outer door, sat a woman. So far, so good. He knows how to start a paragraph. Her long yellow hair rippled down her shoulders. Her gown was green. How green? Green as young reeds. I actually don't know how green that is. Shot with silver. That's not enough. We need to know what kind of silver. Like beads of dew. And her belt was of gold. I bet we're going to find out what kind of gold. Shaped, yep, like a chain of flag lilies set with the pale blue eyes of forget-me-nots. What is going on? In spite of the fact that I do think this is overwritten, I know what Tolkien's going for. I know what he's trying to do. He's establishing Goldberry as a symbol of nature, and that's important. All of the descriptions of her, how green her dress is, how silver the thread is, how gold her belt is, are all described using things we see in nature. And that's because Goldberry, the river woman's daughter, Goldberry it represents nature. She literally comes out of nature, and Tom is her husband. Tom represents knowledge of nature 
character. It's Tom's understanding of the natural world that allows him to be Goldberry's husband and allows him to rescue the hobbits. That is the fairy tale logic of the old forest. And it's contrasted with what happens when we get to Bree. In Bree, we meet humans for the first time. It's the real world. There's real danger in Bree, the danger of the ring race. And for the first time, we meet problems that cannot be solved by just Tom Bombadil singing. In the Shire, there are no problems. It's basically a timeless, ageless, deathless world. Then we get to the fairy tale world. And in the fairy tale world, there are problems easily solved by somebody like Tom Bombadil. Once we leave the old forest, once we leave the borderland and come to Bree, from this point forward, any problems we have are life or death, and they are solved with steel and flame. Because of how overwritten I think the book is, at least I, maybe not you, but at least I tend to miss important things that now for the first time I am noticing. And this is a this is a well-documented, important part of the book I want to read because it's kind of the thesis statement of the entire series. Why are we spending all this time here in this unchanging utopia, in this forest? What are how is Frodo our main character and why? Setting all of that up. We get the beginning of chapter eight, Fog on the Barrow Downs. This is the last chapter before we get to the real world, and it opens with this. That night, they heard no noises, but either in his dreams or out of them, he could not tell which, Frodo heard a sweet singing running in his mind, a song that seemed to come like a pale light behind a gray rain curtain and growing stronger to turn the veil all to glass and silver until at last it was rolled back and a far green country opened before him under a swift sunrise. Now that's a deeply poetic, and to me now, a very moving moment, somewhat obscured by the incredibly flowery language that has been relentlessly deployed up until now. But it is an important bit, and we know it's important because that language is how the book ends. This is one of those things where if you're a huge fan of The Lord of the Rings, you have already connected all of these dots. It's only now for me that I'm starting to understand the import of it. And I feel like I understand why Tolkien made the decisions he made. This is the language that ends The Lord of the Rings. The wind blew, and slowly the ship slipped away down the long gray firth, and the light of the glass of Gladriel that Frodo bore glimmered and was lost. And the ship went out into the high sea and passed on into the west, until at last... On a night of rain, Frodo smelled a sweet fragrance in the air and heard the sound of singing that came over the water. And then it seemed to him that, as in his dream in the house of Bombadil, the gray rain curtain turned all to silver glass and was rolled back, and he beheld white shores and beyond them a far green country under a swift sunrise. Tolkien had already written a big chunk of the Fellowship of the Ring, all the stuff, the birthday party, and a lot of the stuff on the way to Rivendell several times before he really understood that he was writing a story set in Middle-earth, that he was writing the history of the end of the Third Age. Realizing that once he came to understand what the book was about, he didn't go back and edit all that stuff out. He used it. He doubled down on it. He knew it was important for the story he was trying to tell that Frodo begin in this ageless, deathless world, the Shire, and that he moved through a fairy tale land where he has several dreams before entering the world of opposites, the world of life and death and good and evil, the real world of Tolkien's Middle Earth. He knew that spending that time in the Shire, in the Old Forest, was an investment, that it would give all of the events that happened afterwards meaning and weight because it really felt like you had been on a journey. Frodo has three dreams in the Old Forest, but I suspect very few people, if anybody, reading The Lord of the Rings from cover to cover for the first time, when they get to the end of the book, when they get to that section where Frodo goes to the Undying Lands, when he sees effectively heaven, even though Tolkien references the dream in the house of Bombadil, I suspect very few people remember what that dream was or remember that this language is something they've read before. But I think that Tolkien believed it would work anyway, and that it would give you, the reader, the same experience that Frodo was having. Frodo was recalling a dream. He was having an experience in that moment like a dream. He was dying. He was going to heaven. And that you, remembering this fragment of some text from an earlier part of the book, would yourself be having the experience of remembering something like it was a dream. Anyway, that's how 
I see things sitting here now armed with the knowledge that I have probably in 10 years. If I read the books again, I will think something different and come to different conclusions. Uh, if you have made it this far, I thank you for indulging me in my Middle Earth video. There may be more Middle Earth videos in the future. I don't have any planned, but I do think a lot about these books. And we're on break. There's nobody else here. It's just me. So it's an opportunity for me to sort of indulge myself and talk about other stuff than what we usually cover. If you like this video, if you want to support the channel, we don't run ads. We don't have any sponsors. It's just you. If you want to help support the channel, come by our store. You can pick up a copy of Strongholds and Followers. It's a fifth edition supplement. And it, it I think you'll be impressed with how it looks. And it's a lot of fun to read. I wrote it that way on purpose to be fun to read. All the proceeds go to keeping the lights on and the doors open so we can keep making videos and do cool stuff for you folks. No idea what the next video will be. Until next time, peace out. Having read all this stuff, I now feel like I have a much greater context for some of Tolkien's comments. He's famously on the record saying that he detested allegory. He hated being accused of allegory. But now I feel like I understand that really what he was reacting to was people trying to find analogies between World War II and the events of the Lord of the Rings, and there were none. People accused the scouring of the Shire as being a transparent analog for the rebuilding of Britain after World War II. And But he was he said in his letters, he was like, no, that's not what it was about. In fact, what it was about was his childhood memory of the green countryside of England turning into, you know, essentially coal plants everywhere, and how much he hated that, and it seemed like it was the death of the land that he grew up in. So there definitely is, I think, allegory in there. It's just not the out, not the obvious stuff that people were accusing him of that he got sick of. I do think that there are things that happen in the book that are direct analogs to things that happen in Tolkien's life. I cannot be convinced anymore that it's just a coincidence that it's Frodo and his three buddies that sign up for this great adventure and that it was Tolkien and his three best friends who signed up for World War One. And you can read the letters. These kids, they were college students. You can read the letters these kids wrote to each other before they signed up. They thought that they were the best and the brightest of their generation. They were going to one of their country's most prestigious universities. They thought that they were going to change the world when they grew up. And they signed up for this war thinking they were going to have a great, heroic, gallant, noble adventure. And they were going to come back heroes. And they were wrong. They were catastrophically, apocalyptically wrong. So I can't be convinced that the Lord of the Rings is not an attempt on Tolkien's part to give his dead friends, only one of those three kids made it back. And I think the one that did and Tolkien were both deeply affected by what they did and what they saw there. I think the Lord of the Rings is transparently an attempt for Tolkien to give his dead friends the adventure that he thought they were going to have. In the end, all four hobbits get their moment. All four hobbits do something incredible to change the world, just like I think Tolkien thought he and his friends were going to do.